Hi, everyone. I am uh, Mohammed Afzal Sharab, a fifth year PhD student uh, at the Odin Institute, working on uh, working with uh, Dr. Mark Hess, who has also joined the call. Uh, today, I'll talk about my research on modeling the meltwater percolation and formation of uh, ice layers in glacial fern. Uh, before I get into the topic, I'll briefly touch upon what I have been doing for the last four or five years, uh, four years. Um, so uh, all in all, uh, I have been modeling subsurface flow. Can you see my uh, cursor or uh, hand yeah, yeah. in this case? Yeah, perfect, perfect. I'll be using that. Uh, so yeah, so I have been modeling subsurface flow in earth and planetary sciences. Uh, it can be broadly categorized into three uh, big uh, subtopics. One is in hydrology. In hydrology, I'm looking at groundwater flow. Um, and with groundwater, if you think about an example, uh, this is a vertical cross section of a soil or a temperate fern. The fancy colors are the uh, contours of porosity. Porosity is basically uh, the amount of void space in any finite volume or any representative elemental volume. And the porosity varies from 20% uh, to about 80%. Uh, you know, give or take, you can use your favorite numbers, but the idea is to demonstrate this. Uh, so yeah, uh, what happens when uh, on this soil you have excessive rainfall, or if you work in glaciology, uh, if you have an excessive uh, melting at the surface, how will that melt water percolate into that soil? So uh, uh, my advisor and I have developed uh, along with the money uh, from UTEC, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but we have developed this uh, a multi-dimensional numerical model, which can deal with this uh, wetting front along with formation of these perch aquifers. Other than that, I have applied this uh, groundwater infiltration. Uh, I have developed uh, groundwater theory for uh, for early Mars. So about 4 billion years ago, uh, what happened to water on Mars and how uh, or where we can find that water. So re their residence times. In cryosphere, uh, which is the focus of today's talk. I have been looking into the infiltration into fern. I'll talk about what fern is if it is new to you, but it's just a top part of the ice sheet. So we have developed a simple uh, theory of uh, for infiltration into fern, which I'll discuss today, along with the uh, simulations. Okay. Uh, very recently, I'm I have uh, transitioned into icy uh, icy ocean walls from Greenland, and we are also looking at how melt which is generated due, uh, due to impacts, how does that uh, uh, settle inside ice? And that process can take uh, from nine years to about 250 years, depending on what permeability you choose. Lastly, I'm also, invo uh, I'm also uh, involved in some data-driven uh, machine learning uh, based modeling. And uh, I'm trying to understand if you have aquifers, uh, uh, how deep the aquifers form based on uh, actual laboratory experiments done by my collaborator, Eric Hyatt uh, from Jackson School. We're also looking into how uh, soil, uh, how uh, if we can invert some soil parameters from remote sensing using this machine learning model. But that being said, uh, I'd like to give some acknowledge, uh, acknowledgements uh, to people and funding agencies I've been working with. Firstly, uh, Professor Mark Hess for being a fantastic PhD advisor. Then I have collaborators, Surendra Dikari from uh, JPL. He has been instrumental in uh, the work which I'll show today. Along with Cyril and Anya, uh, who have been working at UTEC, Anya has moved to uh, Denmark, I think at, at DTU. But uh, we started this work with them and they have been constant, you know, uh, North Star for this research. And lastly, with Steve uh, Vance at JPL, I'm working on uh, this melt uh, foundering through uh, uh, ice shells of Europa and Titan. And that being said, I've been funded graciously and generously by UTEC uh, through uh, Blue Sky Student Fellowship. Uh, this, uh, this fellowship uh, has really uh, crystallized some of my approaches in this PhD. And thinking about the uh, project we proposed for Blue Sky, uh, I think uh, it has really uh, impacted my research in a positive manner. And UTEC also funds my AGO travels every year, which I greatly appreciate. 
Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, Mark's uh, uh, grant, uh, this NASA Emerging Grant, uh, Emerging Worlds grant has helped me. And moreover, I have received uh, JPL graduate fellowships twice, one last year with uh, Dr. Surendra Dikari to work on Greenland, and one with Steve to work on the ice shells of Europa and Titan this year. That being said, let's move on to the uh, real part, which is infiltration in fern. So uh, I suppose this is a broad audience, so I would like to introduce what is fern. Fern, uh, as my friends say, is shit snow, which means uh, it is an intermediate in between freshly fallen snow, which is about 315 kilograms per meter cubed, to uh, impermeable ice, which is about you know, more than 823 kilograms per meter cube. The maximum density could be 917. Uh, here's, a, here's a CT scan of wet snow uh, for all purposes. Uh, this also uh, shows how a fern would look like. So here uh, you can see this, this is a millimeter scaled CT scan and the blue region is the solid uh, ice face and uh, the red, is the liquid water region. And you can also see these white pockets, which are a non-reactive gas. So this system can also be considered, a, this multi-phase system can be considered a two component system. If you think about it, uh, ice and water are just, uh, ice and liquid water are just water or H2O phase uh, or H2O component. The other component is a non-reactive gas. Uh, since nitrogen is uh, has the majority, we can say, okay, it's it's nitrogen. So this system, which is at millimeter scale, finds its applications at such large scale. For example, if you look at this radar gram from Greenland, from this uh, Kulberg et al. 2021 paper, you'll see that uh, when this snow during summer melts, that melt water goes into the fern uh, or into the top layer of this ice sheet. And there, it can either uh, encounter cold fern and refreeze, or it can be accumulated as a liquid storage, or it can uh, encounter a previously formed ice layer. And, and, and really, uh, instead of going anyways, it can go sideways, and uh, uh, it, it, it is considered runoff. And that runoff is important for estimating sea level rise, okay? If you do remote sensing, you know that refrozen ice layers cause a problem. And moreover, if you have perch aquifer and you do uh, microwave, uh, microwave radio remo based remote sensing, you know that uh, perch aquifers are like blind spots. So we need to study the, uh, the formation of these uh, uh, refrozen layers or ice layers and also how these perch aquifer forms uh, for, uh, in, in, in order to understand how they're uh, contributing to the sea level rise. So in this talk, uh, you can broadly uh, uh, divide this talk into three phases. First, I'll talk about a simple theory that we developed. Uh, that's the only math part I promise in this talk. After that, it's just pretty photos and videos. Um, the second uh, part is uh, developing a brute force numerical or, or uh, numerical model or a simulator. And third part is something which is uh, which is not there out there in the field, which is understanding how the lateral uh, variation or lateral heterogeneities can affect these ice layer and fern hydrology. Okay, so let's talk about modeling because my PhD is more about modeling. So let's uh, start with what's out there already. Okay, you basically have two schools of thought. By the way, any questions uh, up to this point? Since this is a discussion hour, I I would be happy if you have any questions. Okay, silence means no, uh, everyone understood everything. So yeah, moving forward, uh, this tipping bucket model is more of a cell-based approach. You assume that uh, your entire domain or your entire fern column can be divided into several cells. And then if you have uh, you know, moisture content more than a certain amount, it trickles down. It's like a tipping bucket. You have multiple buckets and you have an algorithm if else uh, statements. It's predominantly used in this community fern model. 
very popular in the community and it's inherent in 1D because you're 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 relying on algorithms. It has a lot of free parameters to tune, which you do trying to mimic the data, but it cannot simulate thermodynamic non-equilibrium. And uh, I was at the Future of Greenland Science workshop last year, and they were saying that it's not getting the right numbers, okay? Neither right location of slabs or how deep the water percolates into fern. The other, or an, I wouldn't say newer school of thought, but I would say, uh, it it was uh, founded in 1970s by Kolbeck, but now we have we have rediscovered it. So it's a it's continuum approach. It's based on first principles like mass, momentum, and energy balance. It, in my opinion, it's still in development stage. There is there is a lot to learn and uh, you know a, a lot to implement in this uh, approach. It has potential to go multidimensional. It doesn't have to be just 1D from top to bottom. It can go sideways and do some fancy things, okay? It has it, it does have free parameters to tune, but those free parameters come from physics, okay? Uh, it can simulate uh, thermodynamic non-equilibrium. There's a recent paper by uh, uh, Moore et al. from Caltech who have implemented a thermodynamic non-equilibrium uh, uh, into, into these models. And initial results are very encouraging. So let's see how it pans out when a lot of people uh, start to use these uh, models, okay? So this is the state of the art discussion or summary, but let's talk about what we have here, what's, what's uh, there in our model, okay? As I told you earlier, we have three phases, ice phase with subscript I, water phase or liquid water phase with subscript W and gas phase. Uh, um, we don't care too much about gas because we have this assumption that gas does not participate either in uh, either is moving downwards or percolating or in thermodynamics. And why is that? The reason being uh, water is, uh, sorry, air is, uh, or gas is much less viscous than uh, either ice or water. And moreover, it has a much low thermal conductivity. So it's like an insulator. So it does not carry enthalpy on its own, uh, too much enthalpy, or it, it does not uh, provide any sort of friction. So uh, for example, if you just uh, use your bottle and you pour water, you'll see water coming down due to gravity, there will be some drag, but the drag won't be too much uh, in, in our case. So yeah, here we assume that gas is there, but it's not doing anything to the system. So if we make that assumption, we are uh, left with two conserved quantities in the entire system. Whatever you're modeling, you have two conserved variables. First is uh, what we call composition. Okay, it's a fancy way of saying the total mass per unit volume of H2O or water. So, and, and the symbol we are using is C. So that is equal to the density of water times the volume fraction of water. So imagine you have some very small volume. How much fraction of that volume is filled by water? That's what uh, we mean by volume fraction, okay? And then the other component comes from ice, right? because H2O or uh, water can be either uh, as liquid water or I in the ice phase. So here, that's the density of ice times volume fraction of ice, how much of uh, that volume is in the ice phase, okay? So if we know the total content of H2O, we know that the total content of H2O can change phases, fluid can become solid, liquid water can become ice, but H2O will be preserved, okay? Or, or the total mass of water will be preserved, okay? The other is the total enthalpy, okay? Why we are not considering temperature here, one might ask. And the reason for that is, if you're working with phase change processes, the temperature will be a constant at a phase change. But you know that uh, when, when you're changing phases, enthalpy is a better variable to work with, right? So to preserve that and, and not deal with the funkiness which comes with temperature formulation, we use enthalpy formulation, H. And uh, if you reference your enthalpy at the solidus to be zero, 
you have a very simple formulation of the enthalpy, which is if your temperature is less than the melting temperature. So if your fern is cold, your enthalpy is just the sensible enthalpy of ice. Or, or, or in this case, it's density of ice times uh, specific heat uh, at constant pressure of ice times volume fraction of ice times the cold content, temperature minus melting temperature. Okay, that's that's when the uh, that's when there is no liquid water present and the fern is very cold. So at minus twenty degrees, you know how much the uh, enthalpy is. You just put in minus twenty. You see what's the porosity or what's the volume fraction of ice, and you know the enthalpy of the system. Similarly, uh, at the melting temperature, things get fancy because uh, you have just crossed the solidus, and in that particular case, your enthalpy is the Late, uh, comes from latent heat of fusion of water. And you need to know how much volume fraction of water there is in order to estimate the enthalpy. Okay, L is the latent heat of fusion, which is uh, three, three, five, triple zero joule per kg uh, per kel, uh, yeah, joule per kg, okay. Uh, moreover, if your temperature is greater than melting temperature, we are not, considering that, but in that case, there won't be any ice, right? You have, or you're past the phase transition and there's no ice present and it's just liquid water and air in the system. So in that case, the enthalpy is sensible enthalpy of water plus latent enthalpy uh, which, or latent heat, which you supply to the system. So using this C and H, C and H, with C equals zero means you have no water present in the in that finite volume, and C equals nine hundred seventeen, which is the uh, density of the uh, density of the glacial ice. In that case, there is no gas. So from here to here, you're in, uh, you're decreasing the amount of gas, and you're increasing the amount of H two O in any finite volume. Okay. From bottom to top, you're just increasing the enthalpy in the system. So if you are below zero enthalpy, or if your H is less than zero, in that case, you only have gas and ice. There's no water. Okay. And uh, if you are above zero, you have to see whether you are on this side or on that side. So if you're on this side, uh, this is a three-phase region. With three-phase region, I mean ice, water, and gas exist. Okay, uh, and as you increase the enthalpy, so if you're going here, you're increasing the H2O content. And if you're going up, you're also in supplying more enthalpy to the system. So this contour plot shows the volume fraction of water, which goes from zero, which is here, there's no water, to its maximum value because it has highest enthalpy and highest volume, uh, uh, highest uh, water uh, composition. Right, so highest content of water plus highest enthalpy. So here you have the maximum amount of water, but if you are here, you have the least amount of water. Any questions? I I understand this is uh, this is something more mathy, but uh, any questions on this part? Sorry, this is a dumb question. So on this figure, on your um, right by the H axis, the Y axis, there is a dark blue. Above zero, yeah, where your mouse is at the moment. How can there be no water? Oh, is it just gas in that? It's dark? just gas. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's just cool. gas. Dumb question. Thank you. No worries. Uh, that's that's a great question, actually. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, if there's no if there's no water, it's just zero, right? It's all gas. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we know what's conserved. Now we talk about how are these being conserved, or what is the model. Uh, that we are using. And in that case, uh, let me introduce these conservation equations. What is being conserved and how is it being conserved? And uh, the first equation is the conservation of total amount of water. And uh, the first term means how is the composition changing with respect to time? And the composition can only change when there is a flux of water. The second term is the flux of water. Here we assume that the ice does not move. You can have you can have compaction, right? We are not assuming compaction in this uh, problem. 
okay, at, at such small time scales. If you're talking about years, then you have to think about how is the ice compacting with time, okay? So it's the divergence of the uh, convective flux of water. So this rho is the density of water times this flux of water, okay? Whenever there is some water motion, water coming in or leaving some volume, only then your uh, composition will change, okay? So total amount of water is conserved. That's what it is saying. Uh, similarly, the bottom equation is saying the total amount of enthalpy in the system is conserved, which means there, is, there will be a change in enthalpy if there is a flux of, uh, flux of uh, enthalpy. And the flux can be divided into two components. The first component says, uh, the flux which is carried by moving water, because we know that if there is water moving, it's carrying its latent heat. So where is that latent heat going? This is the convection of heat. Okay, so Q is the flux of water or volumetric flux of water times uh, the density of water times the specific heat. So this is a convective flux. The other term is the conductive flux. Conductive flux uh, has this K, uh, it's the thermal conductivity of this three-phase composite, okay? And then you have a gradient of temperature. So uh, there will be a flux wherever uh, you have temperature going from high to low, the heat will flow in that direction. Oh no, heat will flow opposite. If there is a change, ah yeah, so if there is a gradient in temperature, heat will flow from high temperature to low temperature. That's what uh, it is saying here. Okay, so this volumetric flux of water, we have uh, wrote two papers in this series talking about how to calculate this volumetric flux. In this uh, model, we are assuming that there are no capillary effects. You know, whenever there is water inside soil or inside fern or porous media, there can be capillary effects. So we assume that there are no capillary effects. And in that case, if uh, our medium is not saturated, which means our aquifer has not purged completely, the water will always move downwards. And how fast will it move? It will move according to its uh, unsaturated hydraulic conductivity uh, of the medium, okay? So this SW is the water saturation. Uh, water saturation is basically, if you have a void space inside certain box, how much of that void space is occupied by water? So what's that fraction? And that fraction is the uh, water saturation, okay? But if you perch, you have to solve this two-phase system or uh, total mass balance and consider uh, uh, gas phase as well. Don't go into detail of it, but uh, these are two papers which talk about this approach. So we developed this for uh, first for temperate fern or soil, but now uh, for this work, we have applied it uh, along with the thermodynamics to investigate fern, okay? So this is the model and uh, any questions? Because this is, I think the main slide of the presentation and we'll, you know, there are two or three more slides where we talk about math, but then we'll go into uh, more of the uh, results and, and its applications. Any question? Okay, if not, then let's move forward. Uh, so now first thing is uh, we want to, we want to develop this simple theoretical model. Uh, and why we want to do it, we want to be sure that whatever we are simulating makes sense. And in order to uh, for that to make sense, we have to have something back of the envelope that we can compare to. And for that purpose, we will first scale the model. With scaling, I mean, uh, I, I mean getting rid of all the dimensions in the model, okay? Why we do it, there are three reasons. First is we want to clean up the equations. We want to get rid of all the uh, numbers. Okay, we, we just want to work with dimensionless quantities. Secondly, maybe you find one phenomenon much more dominating compared to some other phenomenon. So in that particular case, you can just get rid of that, get rid of things which don't matter. Lastly, if we, we take this approach, we can make the model scale independent which means you throw in your favorite number, you get your favorite answer. We, we've done some sort of universal uh, simulation and, and you give me hydraulic conductivity, you give me your favorite 
uh, porosity permeability relationships and, and so on and so forth. And I will give you the answer. Based on one simulation, I can explain uh, infinite uh, processes in nature. So that's why we want to make the system more general. And that's why we do all this dimensionless analysis. So uh, first, for this simple theoretical model, not for all the cases, we rely on the model I presented on the previous slide. And I, uh, what I did for this simple study is I said, OK, make this bizarre assumption where uh, the density of ice is the same as density of water is equal to rho. OK, and uh, some people might not be happy, but it's just for this theoretical sort of uh, theory development. OK, so what we did was we introduced some dimensionless variables and why we did it. You'll see that in a moment. OK, so what we did first was we said, OK, this curly C is the dimensionless composition. So what we did uh, to the composition, we just said, OK, uh, the composition can be uh, scaled with the density of water or ice. Okay, uh, in this case, the enthalpy is uh, enthalpy is scaled with the density of uh, density of water times the latent heat of fusion of water. We also used this uh, scale temperature, which is temperature minus melting temperature over melting temperature. Uh, we had this uh, scaled depth variable. Z is generally the depth. We are talking in terms of depth for this 1D model. And uh, if we scale the depth with some characteristic length, the characteristic length could be, OK, how deep is the ice layer in your system? What's the characteristic length that you're working with? So just think about this as some length, which you might want to figure out later when you're dealing with a specific problem. And then we also had this dimensionless time. Dimensionless time is time times uh, hydraulic conductivity over this uh, length scale, characteristic length scale delta. In that case, uh, your conserved variable become these uh, fancy looking things, but let's not talk too much about math. This theory is all about sketching, okay? And I'll show you how you can sketch your analytic or your theoretical results, okay? So uh, you remember the CH diagram from the previous slide? This is a corresponding CH diagram in the dimensionless framework. So rather than something going from 0 to 917 and your enthalpy with some bizarre numbers, it's all going from 0 to 1, looking so nice. Okay, uh, It's the same volume fraction plot. I have not plotted things in this uh, water plus ice, uh, sorry, water plus gas region without ice because that's not what we are too concerned with. We care too much about this three-phase region as well as uh, region below it, which is gas plus uh, ice with no water. Okay, just showing you the similarity between something which was dimensionless earlier and now it's uh, sorry it's, uh, something which was which was dimensional earlier, but now it's dimensionless. It turns out that uh, from the scaling that if if your length scale that you are considering, if it is order of meters, your heat diffusion might be thousand times smaller than heat convection. Okay, and that's a big one because we talk too much about uh, diffusion and it's considered an important phenomenon, but it turns out that for these meltwater percolation problems, um, at least for, for uh, the problems that we will be considering, the heat diffusion might be much smaller than heat convection. And uh, what we can do is uh, in that particular case, we can uh, we can get rid of the diffusion from the system, and then we are left with this dimensionless uh, uh, system of uh, partial differential equations, where uh, the change in uh, dimensionless time of this variable u, which consists of uh, dimensionless composition and dimensionless enthalpy, this system will only change when there is uh, advection of water. Okay, so this divergence of this flux vector, the flux vector is uh, Fc and Fh. Fc and Fh can be, uh, this is flux of composition and this is flux of uh, enthalpy. The way we scale these things made it seem like um, there is only advection when there is, or, or there when, the, when there's convection, it comes from, uh, it, it's the same as the flux of water in the system, okay? Let's not go into too much detail. I feel like uh, people are getting bored. 
but we did something from the basic uh, basic applied mathematics theory. Um, this is this is a classic form of a hyperbolic partial differential equation. It's a weird way of saying that um, these equations uh, correspond to waves moving in a system. There can be different forms of waves. If you have ever heard about shock wave, it's because uh, you your governing equations had this sort of form. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, we can uh, linearize this system and and do some tricks. The thing is. Um, if you linearize this system, you will get this flux uh, uh, or, or flux Jacobian or this uh, fancy matrix. It's a two by two matrix uh, from the governing equations. And uh, something from high school, eigenvalue decomposition. If you do the eigenvalue decomposition of this, uh, this matrix, you'll find its eigenvalue and eigenvectors. And it turns out that these eigenvalues are how fast uh, characteristics or fronts will be move, uh, that move into the system. These fronts can be a wetting front or a drying front, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. And if you remember the CH plot from the previous slides, um, the eigenvectors are shown here with blue and red line, okay? So what do these eigenvectors represent? These eigenvectors represent uh, the pathways, so you can go along this eigenvector and you are satisfying that partial differential equation or you're satisfying the model. In other words, you don't have to solve things by math, but you can just look at this plot. And if I give you some conditions, you can find your own answer by sketching. Okay, so this theory is all about sketching. Sorry for the blurb or, or for the weird math in the previous slides. But yeah, this is basically... Uh, it if I give you two points in the in this uh, CH plane or we also call it hodograph plane, you can sketch your analytic solution. So your solution has to follow these uh, red and blue lines in order to be uh, in order to satisfy the uh, governing equations. Okay, this has not been done in the literature, so this is really the first time we are doing this in fern hydrology. So if you are moving from low to high values of uh, uh, this lambda, okay? If you're moving uh, towards that, you'll see uh, that uh, you'll, you'll form a continuous for front, which is known as drying front or uh, a rare faction wave. But if I change the direction of this, rather than going from uh, bottom to top, you go from top to bottom. In that case, uh, it's a shock wave or a wetting front. But yeah, forget this, but let's only talk about sketching, okay? Uh, in this uh, in this slide. So firstly, uh, I'll, I'll talk about three problems uh, in the next few slides. There is no more math in the entire presentation. So sorry if I bored you in any way. So imagine you have a fern. So just look at this particular uh, plot, okay? It shows you, uh, it shows you a fern with uh, about 90% uh, porosity. I know that's unrealistic, but for the sake of this problem, let's assume that it, it has about 90% porosity and 10% volume fraction of ice. At some point, uh, there, is, um, there is an infiltration happening or there is an increased flux of meltwater. So you can see in the bottom uh, of this, in this one dimensional setting, you have very low volume fraction of water. So you are at residual water saturation or uh, the minimum uh, saturation or the fern is just, you know, um, barely has some water. Okay. At some point, you have a melting event that happens. And at the top of it, you see this, uh, this front, uh, this wetting front. Okay. So here the saturation is much higher. It's about uh, 90%. Okay. Or 80% uh, at the, at the top. And let's see how this system uh, evolves with time. Uh, here it shows the temperature and water saturation. So water saturation is about 80 uh, to 90%. And this A means the analytic solution. So coming from the sketching, you can uh, sketch these two points. This is the left state and this is the right state. You can sketch these two points on this uh, C H plot. So here, uh, the, this is the point uh, given here. 
okay, at the top. And this is the point given at the bottom. So this is the top state, this is the bottom state. And all you have to do is follow the uh, follow the follow these red lines, okay? These can be connected by red lines. If they're not connected by red lines, they may want to go uh, with the blue lines first and then connect with the red lines. So you can, con uh, you can basically make your uh, analytic solution through these uh, lines. Okay, let me play the video in this case. So as you see, with time, there is a front that propagates downwards. Think about a melting event, okay, or, or a rainfall on, on, a, on a temperate fern in this case, okay. How about we switch roles and we say this is the top state. So the top state is drier and bottom state is wetter. So that's our uh, next problem. So top state is this one, which is drier if you do the math or if you do the calculations. Uh, the bottom state is uh, wetter. So think about rather than rainfall uh, happening, rainfall just abruptly stops, okay? What happens in that case? How will the fern dry uh, if, if that happens? So in that particular case, you see this uh, bottom region is much more saturated, whereas the top region is less saturated because there is an abrupt reduction in rainfall. And let's see how that um, uh, pans out. Okay, so in that particular case, rather than a wetting front, which, uh, which was like a sharp change, you have this smoothening in between these two uh, states. One was highly, you know, or one was almost saturated. The other one was almost dry. In that particular case, they are connected by this smooth transition, and and that just stretches with time. Okay, um, yeah. So any questions? I understand that that's a lot to take in, but uh, um, I'll show a realistic example from uh, from the observations in in the next few slides. So. Let me let me just give you a slight bonus. So the bonus is if what happens if you have uh, what happens if you have the left state being right uh, light rainfall. So imagine uh, this is your case where uh, you are supplying about ninety percent air and ten percent water to the fern. Okay, and the fern is cold. So fern is about um, fern is about I think seventy percent. Uh, or no, uh, it's it's about 60, 70% uh, porous. And then um, 60, 70% volume fraction, so about 30% porous. And it's cold. The temperature of fern is about minus 22.6 degrees Celsius, which is average for uh, fern temperature uh, during the cold season in Dave and I's cap. And there's a light rainfall at zero degrees. So the fern... Uh, the point or the, the state point of fern is this one, okay? And since it is below, that's the final point. And uh, the light rainfall, which is happening on the surface, it's this point, okay? You can calculate, you can do the math and it's very easy to calculate, you know, uh, what's, what's going to be uh, this point, okay? So in that particular case, you first go on this uh, first eigenvector, also uh, known as slow path. And then uh, there is some intermediate state and we'll see if there is an intermediate state. And uh, from that intermediate state, there is this fast path, okay? Uh, fast path or path parallel to these, uh, these uh, second eigenvectors or uh, uh, shown here in red line. So let's see how it looks like. So in this particular case, what's happening? Here, when there is rainfall on cold fern, a part of that rainwater refreezes. And when it refreezes, it chokes the fern. You're forming frozen fringes. And that frozen region is this intermediate region shown on this plot, okay? And the rest of it is filled with water. So in a way, we are, we are seeing a frozen fringe formation, but the question might be, can this reduction in porosity go uh, to, form impermeable ice layers or not. Interestingly, the how fast this uh, front moves downwards uh, is identical to uh, Myron Hewitt's 2017 paper, and that explains data 
from Greenland. Okay, so people actually use this. So we are trying to develop this sketching theory for this uh, uh, foreign infiltration problem. But now let's look at a realistic problem and try to see if, if this theory holds in, in practical life or not. Okay. Um, I know that that was the only math part, but we'll be we'll be faster from here. So here in this particular uh, presentation, I'll talk about this high fidelity fern hydrology study. Um, there is this group uh, at University of Alberta. What they did was they went to the southwestern part of Greenland called I2, and they installed thermistors and time domain reflectometers. And they measured the density and the temperature before melting happens. What they found in their work was uh, both annual and diurnal variations in temperature contribute to melting. And the melting was mainly observed during June, July, and August period. Okay, They developed a continuum 1D model, uh, 1D model, and they chose free parameters in their models without any experiments. What they also tried to do was to model ice layers empirically in 1D. You know, if you have an infinitesimally thin ice layer, it will stop the flow downwards. But if you think about the lateral extent as well, these connected, uh, these uh, thin ice layers are not very well connected. So they tried to model this multidimensional phenomena in, in 1D. So they say that, you know, you need to have a 2D model. And that's what we'll focus on uh, in this talk. So yeah, uh, this is their result, okay? Um, on the top, you see the temperature from their, uh, from their uh, sensors. Don't go into detail, but I'm just showing you uh, a few things uh, from this plot. On the bottom, you have depth, and all these are uh, varying with the weeks. One big box is one week, one small box is one day. Okay, so I want to I want to model this uh, melting event, and in order to model this melting event, I have to break this down into a simple problem, and that simple problem is this uh, nine to twelfth August twenty sixteen event uh, that happened here. So imagine you have some extreme melting happening, and due to that extreme melting, the liquid water content, which is the same as volume fraction of water. It went from zero, so zero being the dry fern, to three being uh, three being you have three percent of water in a certain uh, uh, certain volume. So when you have that happening, you see uh, water percolating into this snowpack. Okay, they had two sites. This A and B means uh, site A and site B, and the, they have different depths at which they install these sensors. So yeah, I want I care about this event as a first pass and then we'll talk about modeling this entire uh you know entire season entire summer uh in this case so the theory that we were talking about uh for a while that tells us that uh once there is melting you have a wetting front that moves downwards and moreover when the rainfall or when the melting stops you have a drying front which is which is at the end of this melting event. And uh, if you do some, you know, if you do some extractions, you can tell how fast that uh, wetting front was moving. And from, so it was moving at the speed 1.6 meters a day. And from that speed, you can actually calculate the meltwater flux, which is about 0 0.048 meters per day. And uh, Brooks Corey exponent, uh, it's a relation or it's a power law exponent between porosity and permeability. And that comes out to be two, which is, I think, what they chose in their modeling assumptions. So all in all, what I'm trying to say is if you have this fern infiltration data, if you ever come across that data, we can extract these uh, snow parameters out of that data using this simple theory. But now let's switch gears and talk about uh, simulations and uh, so from that, uh, for that, I'm referring to the first mathy slide I showed. So no assumptions except water, uh, except gas does not participate. No other assumptions, no simplifications. Okay. So think about uh, think about that problem where you have about fifty percent porous fern, and it's it's cold and dry. Cold with cold, I mean it's at minus ten degrees Celsius in the entire 
fern column, but close to the surface, I have a, I have what? I have a thermal boundary layer. I'm saying that the temperature linearly goes from minus 10 to zero as you move closer and closer to the surface. And in that particular case, I apply a liquid water content of 3% for four days, as was given on the previous slide, right? Uh, so if uh, you go here, the liquid water content is about 3%. So that is my reference for all the almost all the simulations I'll show in the next few slides. So first is uh, this infiltration without heat diffusion. So let me play the video. This is the porosity. Porosity is basically what's not ice. And that can be gas, that can be water. So what amount or what fraction of that volume is uh, void and not uh, occupied by solid uh, grains of ice. The liquid water content is uh, the volume fraction of water. People in the fern hydrology community use this LWC more than volume fraction of water or saturation. So that, uh, to be consistent with them, I have used this. And last is the temperature in degrees Celsius. So this is the simulation without heat diffusion. Uh, let me play the video. Okay, so if I scroll back, what's happening here is initially you have a wetting front that moves downwards and this is a cold fern. So a part of uh, a part of fluid will uh, refreeze and that's why you have this reduction in porosity. Uh, and that reduction is about 3%, right? From point or 6%, from 0.5 to 0.47 uh, porosity. Right, and that is due to refreezing when you have warm water, and and yeah, it keeps moving. But after four days, I switch off the tap. I say, okay, nothing goes deeper. So in, instead of or in addition to the sweating front, you have a drying front that emanates at the back. You can see the drying front similar to the one I showed in that theory. Right, you have a drying front, and after a while, they interact. And when they interact, the water content shown in this uh, video. It moves down and, and your front is also slowing down because you don't have too much water uh, to go deeper. Now, one might ask what happens when I switch on the heat diffusion? And in that case, uh, here's the simulation, exact same simulation. I've just switched on the heat diffusion in this problem. Look here. You can see it's uh, the the saturation is also or liquid water content is also reducing due to drying. So in this process, you have same reduction of about uh, six percent initially, but once these uh, uh, fronts meet, then you have a huge reduction in porosity, and that really is the formation of ice lens. So after the waves interact, uh, you have a reduction, you have a sharp reduction in porosity because of heat diffusion. And that leads to formation of ice lens. This is a this is a new mechanism of ice lens formation in glacial fern. And we have submitted this work. Uh, but if you uh, if you want to see these two side by side, the left one shows the case without diffusion, right is the uh, with diffusion, uh, case with diffusion. The top uh, contour is of porosity. The bottom contour uh, uh, adds both liquid water content and temperature together. Red is temperature, blue is liquid water content. So here you have uh, here you have this um, uh, wetting front moving downwards, and then after four days you have a drying front that emanates. You see this uh, smoothening. On x-axis you have the time in days. Okay, so after four days you start to see this uh, variation. And once these fronts interact at this depth called interaction depth, uh, you start to see a reduction in the speed of this wetting front and it, it does not go deeper, right? And you can see the porosity reduction is not too much compared to the other case where after interaction, uh, you, even before interaction, you see there is some sort of uh, thermal boundary layer. This red 
shows that there is some sort of thermal uh, boundary layer or diffusive layer uh, in the front. But once these front interact, it starts to grow and grow and grow. And in that particular case, if you look in the porosity contour, uh, you can see that there is a sharp reduction in the porosity and that leads to these uh, ice layer uh, formation. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay, uh, so let's keep moving. Uh, you might be interested in how deep, sorry, you might be interested in how deep these ice layers form. We call it penetration depth or ZP. Uh, they can depend on how cold your fern is or how much water you're supplying or for how long you're supplying the water and the porosity of fern. So this uh, plot shows the penetration depth with zero being here, which means everything is just getting refrozen at the surface. You have ice layer at the surface too, you have ice layer at 20 meters depth, okay? So if your temperature difference is not too much, if your ice is just at minus six degrees, it's that case, it's very temperate, if the ice is uh, at zero degrees, ideally you can percolate as deep as you can. But if you have a cold ice layer, say at minus 20 degrees, minus 30 degrees, in that particular case, your uh, front will just uh, freeze at the surface. It wouldn't want to go deeper because your ice is colder, okay? And if you increase the liquid water content from 3% to 7%, uh, you can see that you're uh, you're penetrating much and much deeper. Okay. Uh, moreover, instead of for four days, what happens if you apply the same thing for fourteen days? Do you still penetrate deeper, or do you you know you pond somehow? And what we found from this study was okay. If you have fourteen days of pulse, uh, in that case you penetrate up to twenty meters depth instead of two meters, and uh, if your fern is very porous, okay, rather than fern being much less poor, uh, much less porous, or uh, if you talk about density, if the fern has very low density, uh, then it's very porous. So if your fern is porous, you go much much deeper. Okay, it turns out that uh, you may want to have a simple formula uh, in order to deal with these complicated uh, scalings. And to understand that, we did some back of the envelope analysis from the theory I showed. And it turns out that they almost fall on top of each other if we scale them uh, with this uh, fancy uh, looking formula. Um, I know it's uh, it might not be readable. Um, so here, it's basically a simple formula which makes all the data lie on top, not exactly on top, but still very close to each other. So we found a simple formula to calculate the depth of ice layer formation uh, from our simulations, okay? Uh, but now next thing would be, uh, next thing would be, okay, uh, these, uh, that the climate uh, is changing and you can have, uh, you know, diurnal variations, you can have uh, seasonal variations. So you might wanna know what happens to that same fern if you have a cyclic uh, change in thermal forcing, okay? And with thermal forcing, I mean surface flux. How is that surface flux changing? And if it is changing like a sine wave, which means you can have a, you can have a warm period and then you can have a cold period and then you can have a warm, cold, warm, cold, blah, blah, blah. And with cold conditions, I mean that your net flux or your average flux is always zero or it is uh, below zero. So you are basically taking heat uh, away from the system rather than uh, uh, warming the fern, you are just either taking whatever you have provided thermally or you are taking way more than what you have provided. So in this case, this is, uh, this is a zero mean thermal flux. Thermal flux can come from turbulent forcing, or short wave, long wave radiations and, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm just thinking about thermal forcing at the surface of this fern. So uh, the same fern, 50% porous, cold and dry with minus 10 degrees Celsius temperature. The exact same fern, but the conditions at the surface change now. Instead of one melt period, 
I'm applying multiple uh, heating and cooling cycles. Okay, and uh, let's see what happens in that case. So this is the temperature. You can see the temperature is changing when it is uh, zero or goes in the zero dimension. Uh, you can see the melt water is generated and it, then it refreezes in the cold cycle and forms these ice layers or reduction in porosity. That is, um, you know, I'm just trying to understand the pattern of these ice layers. So, yeah, uh, it's it's like a snake that does the wiggle. Uh, there is analytic solution uh, when you do not melt, but in this case, you do melt. So you, at the end, you form this nice close to uh, close to the surface uh, uh, layer of uh, ice. Okay, and and low porosity ice layers. But what happens uh, in the other case where uh, you can have warming conditions? And with warming conditions, I mean. Uh, rather than zero being the mean of the flux forcing, you have a positive mean. So in the condition of, uh, consider global warming. What is global warming? You are getting more flux, but uh, you're not, you know, or in, in a sum, you are getting more flux into the system or thermal forcing into the system. And in that particular case, uh, it's the same problem, but at this time you're supplying more heat to the system. So it's like a condition of global warming. So let's uh, run this video. You can see front going up and then it is forming an ice layer. And uh, again, but this time it is crossing up over because the fern is not cold anymore. It's already warmed. So you can see another ice layer forming deeper, okay? Rather than something forming close to the surface, you're penetrating deeper and deeper into the fern. Uh, for this case. So yeah, so you can compare these two cases and you can say that for a cold season, uh, this is the porosity contour. This is the this is how the flux, thermal flux at the surface changing uh, for this net zero or cold case versus warming case. And uh, these are the resulting uh, porosity contours. And lastly, you have this blue being the liquid water content and red being the temperature contours. And in this particular case, you see two uh, very different dynamics. In the first case, you're seeing that, okay, your ice layer forms close to the surface if you're cold uh, all the time, okay? Or, or if, it is, if it is net zero uh, forcing. But if it is a warming condition or, uh, you see a deeper percolation of uh, meltwater and you see formation of ice layers deeper and deeper into the fern. So it depends, uh, depends on how much warming there is into the, uh, at, at a certain location. You can see these two types of uh, ice layer uh, patterns. Lastly, I'll show you the model for uh, when you use the field data. So uh, here you have the porosity uh, of uh, porosity measured uh, from this paper by Wendy Crew in 2021. It's called RecMap. You can find that. So I just literally use the porosity data. I use the temperature data, and then I applied the surface flux or surface thermal forcing. And yeah, let's see what system looks like and how it evolves. This is uh, 24th May 2016. Uh, time don't care about that, but it's more of a daily. Uh, variation. So you can see again this wiggle, which comes from the data, uh, and it's not synthetic anymore. So you can see I I have the initial uh, profile in light gray color just to show you how how much change you expect in the entire fern after each melting event, and there will be two main melting event which will change the stratigraphy. I'm sorry, this uh, presentation is going way longer, um, but <laughs> let me know if you have any questions. So this sky blue line, just to, uh, just to clarify, the sky blue line is the region or, or this region is where you, you have seen complete melting. So there is no fern anymore at this point. The 
the fern has melted completely and that has resulted in melt water uh, coming downwards. And you can see that uh, you have an ice layer forming here and at different points uh, in this uh, problem. Hi, Mark. Good to see you. Um, Hi there. I just had a visual comment. You know, when yeah. you begin this simulation and the temperature curve sort of appears to sort of wander off out of the right hand side of the figure, when re is there a way to essentially plot an equal thickness vertical line along, you know, I mean, essentially when the temperature is zero, right? But, but at the very beginning, it does sort of look like you just didn't continue the axis. It looks like it just sort of moves out. Uh, and this I think one? if you, yeah. So yeah, if you yeah, if you keep it going, if you just click it. <clears throat> okay, please move. Yeah. Well, yeah. So exactly. So when it here now, right? So yeah. I think it'd be great if there was a long right. So it seems like it just you're not plotting far enough out to the right. Be nice if there that vertical piece of the temperature graph had the same thickness right now it has to, then it would be clear that the temperature clearer that the temperature there is zero okay sounds good i'll, I'll do that uh, but yeah i mean uh, in in the interest of time i would say that we did some interesting uh, experiment the on the previous uh, i showed uh, pre previous slide i showed you the simulations and what i did was i applied this net thermal forcing shown here in red color uh, and I agree it looks nasty, but that's how the real data looks like. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's that's the input to the model. And this blue curve is the accumulation rate. So how much of uh, freshly fallen snow has fallen, uh, freshly fallen snow has accumulated on top of uh, this fern, okay? And uh, the bottom two contours are the result, okay? And this, this is again the porosity and uh, liquid water content and temperature contours. Uh, you can see that uh, whenever there is melt percolation, you see a change in uh, ch uh, variation in the uh, porosity. And here you have an ice layer at about 1.2 meters depth, but the newest ice layer that forms uh, is close to 2.4 meters uh, depth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lastly, this, uh, this liquid water content and temperature contour shows you that there are two main melting events when there is a there is an increase there is a stark increase in the flux of water and uh, at those events you start to see melt water percolating deeper and deeper here this black line shows the observations from this uh, upward looking ground penetrating radar so these are these are the actual observations uh, at the same site uh, in in uh, Greenland, so you can see that we are able to somehow capture the depth, although we are little off, and there is a faster percolation uh, in the uh, or observed in the uh, in uh, from the radar, and that might be due to preferential flow and uh, thermodynamic non-equilibrium. But yeah, uh, that's that. I I would think in interest of time, I'll just uh, I'll just quickly skip. We did the same simulations in two D which I'm not able to show in interest of time. And I'm sorry, it's taking more than what it should. And yeah, I had a lot of slides, but uh, what I just to summarize uh, what we did in 2D was uh, we have the first large scale simulator that can do tens to hundreds of meters to kilometer simulations. We can see how stratigraphy change uh, over uh, kilometers of length scales, which I don't think any other simulator can do at this point and they uh, actually match with the data as well. So to conclude this presentation, we first developed this kinematic wave infiltration theory, and that helps us develop analytic solutions, and that can form benchmark problems. It can help investigate some physical phenomenon and extract fund parameters. We also got to know about this uh, mechanism of ice layer formation. The 1D uh, results uh, and 2D, which I haven't shown you, but Trust me, there are 2D results. Um, they showed that ice layers form when there is a diff uh, when there is a diffusion acting after waves uh, interact. And with waves, I mean drying and wetting front at the beginning and at the end of the uh, of, of a melting event. Okay, we can calculate the depth, uh, approximate depth of ice layer by a simple formula. And what we found was if you have more more melt generating. And if you're, uh, the, the fern is more porous, 
it will lead to deeper formation of ice layers. From the cyclic studies, we found that a warming climate leads to a much deeper percolation. And I haven't shown this to you, but if there is an extremely high meltwater flux, in that particular case, uh, you can form ice chunks, which people in the field have observed using remote sensing. Uh, so, and, and that happens because you have birch aquifers forming inside the fern. So with that, I think I'll, I'll just leave you on this slide and I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, uh, I went way over uh, my time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very cool work, Oxel. Um, A couple of questions and I'll yes. start. So mm -hmm. yeah, you have this last point about like these perch aquifer like implications. And so I'm wondering like, if you thought yeah. about like how long would you need to like run your model to decide or even like compare with like the remote sensing data about how long it takes for some of these aquifers to form within, yeah, within this framework. I so, guess. okay. I think in order to answer uh, your question, I'll just play this video just to show you some time scales when this uh, uh, process is happening. So, I was talking all about 3% liquid water content at the surface, but imagine instead of 3%, you have 10% at the surface okay, of the same fern. And uh, the length scale is order of uh, 20 meters. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming you know 10 meters, uh, order of 10 meters length scale. And in that particular case, let me run the simulation. So, yeah. Firstly, you start to see these, uh, you know, this is again the four day event. Okay. Uh, firstly, you start to see this formation of ice layers um, when you have an infiltration uh, event happening. It also depends on locally, uh, what's your topography. If you have some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of region where you have locally high volume or high flux of meltwater, in that case, you uh, will you will have a local sort of increase in meltwater flux. And if your fern is heterogeneous, you don't your water doesn't or water cannot move downwards, but instead it has to go sideways, right? So a lot of these fern simulators cannot handle perching because mm -hmm. perching has its own issues. So there are two problems that we are solving. First is large scale, uh, large scale or spatial scale problem. Okay, you cannot do large scale. You have to have a very highly resolved grid in order to do these simulations. Secondly, um, you cannot do perching that easily. So we solve these two problems in this framework. And as you could see, uh, forming these ice layers is a game of uh, you know few weeks, you know two weeks in this particular case. And you can see that your uh, porosity is actually going to zero here. Uh, so you are forming these bizarre structures rather than these nice and flat uh, ice layers. So if you have any observations, it would be nice to couple these simulations with those observations. Although I've seen some people showing the remote sensing observations and making speculations. Good thing is we can model this and claim that yes, uh, ice chunks are uh, there and due to this local increase in meltwater flux. Yeah, super cool. Any other questions? I think that's it. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you giving this presentation. Thank you so much for staying. And I'm sorry, this was a one, and a one hour and 15 minutes presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, so sorry about nice that. Stuff. Yeah, very nice yeah. work. Anyway, Thank you right. so much. See you Thank later. you.